Can you surely confirm whether you guys see my screen? Yes, you're all set. We see you and your slides. Perfect. Thank you so Take much. Take it away. So, of course, it's a really great pleasure to be here at yet another fantastic bioconductor conference, I think, and I'll be speaking about protein protein interactions from the Bioplex project and how we are working with it in R and Python. Before I begin, I, I'd like to especially acknowledge Roger and Tyrone, who really did a lot of work on the um, um, Python side. All right, so I think many of us are uh, familiar with protein protein interactions and um, know that there are, I think, many good reasons for studying protein protein interactions. But just to mention here a few, um, knowing a protein's interact uh, interactors, interactors can, of course, provide insight into a protein's biological function, place a protein within biological pathways, and reveal mechanisms underlying biological processes as protein complexes form basically and underlie many aspects of cell biology. And similar to um, uh, NGS technologies, the throughput has also substantially increased over the last years in experimentally detect protein protein, inter uh, protein protein interactions when it comes from like individual experiment targeting only one proteins and their interactors up to prote proteome-wide protein protein interactions where you're able to and detect um, uh, the, the interactors of up to thousands of proteins. So there are many experimental techniques um, for um, detecting protein-protein uh, interactions. The two main techniques are used to hybrid uh, screening, which I think many of us um, have heard of um, at one point or another. And here in the Bioplex project, um, we're making especially use of affinity purification mass spectrometry. And just like a basic idea of how this works, you basically express a library of exogenous bait proteins in a human cell lines, and these bait proteins um, basically have an affinity tag. And then you pull out these bait proteins um, via immunopurification and basically check which proteins um, actually bind to your bait proteins. And we call these proteins that bind to these bait proteins that you introduce, we call them prey proteins. And you can basically apply something like mass spectrometry to basically get the identity of these prey proteins ending up with a bait proteins, uh, with a bait protein and, and, and the, uh, the prey proteins that interact with that um, um, a bait protein. And although this technology is well established for like around like 25 years here in the Bioplex project, it really has been taken to another level um, and uh, applied at a, at, a, at, a, at a proteome scale. So looking a little bit at the project and, and, and when it started, um, actually back in 2015 in the first cell publication, um, where they investigated uh, a human cell line, an embryonic kidney cell line, HEC 293T, and uh, targeted around 2,500 bait proteins. And over the years, the project has um, scaled up um, to basically half the proteome, um, around 10,000 um, um, baits. And as you uh, can see, uh, Bioplex has also started to expand to other cell lines. So in, in the latest publicly available version, it, it's now available also in a, in a human colon cancer cell line, HCT116. And behind the scenes, um, 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 Bioplex has started to embark also investigating other cell lines. And the plan is to also to scale up um, to basically almost uh, uh, the full human proteome. Um, um, and, and, and accordingly, you have these um, different, uh, you have here up to 40,000 individual um, experiments that are uh, conducted. So um, comparing um, Bioplex to previous efforts um, and, and existing databases, such of course String and BioGrid, you see that there's a lot of new stuff um, that you can learn from. And when you look at like the number of proteins that are studied and the number of interactions that are studied, then the individual Bioplex networks for the two main cell lines, but also in combined form, are in a different order of magnitude than previous um, uh, efforts. And actually, when you compare to existing databases, such as BioGrid that might report low throughput or high throughput PPIs, there are a lot of interactions that are not in, 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 in current databases. 
So that makes Bioplex, of course, a very valuable um, resource. It also enables computational discovery. And this is where um, we started to think about how to make Bioplex programmatically accessible um, from within R and from within Python, how to represent Bioplex, um, how to efficiently manipulate it, and how to connect it to um, downstream applications and domain-specific packages in, in, in R and Python. And um, this is basically um, what we did here, and I'm going to decompose this figure now panel by panel. But um, um, the, the main um, aspects here is importing um, um, the, the networks in either R or Python, and then um, allow a number of analysis um, with regard to protein complexes, protein domains, with the recent um, interest uh, in protein structures through the, the AlphaFold um, um, kind of like revolution. Um, uh, we also have a lot of stuff on protein structures and of course integration with omics data. And these packages that we ended up implementing for um, accessing Bioplex and for analyzing Bioplex data together with other um, um, data sources um, are available on Bioconductor and, and, and PipPi. So let's start with looking a little bit into this import piece here. And I think one thing that we need to realize and what I hope I introduced clear enough is that there are two types of, of, of proteins here, these um, uh, uh, full circles are these bait proteins, these exogenous uh, proteins that we introduce into the cell. And then there are these bait proteins that, uh, uh, these prey proteins that are endogenous proteins and that are bind to these um, 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 bait proteins. And basically, if you um, take these little network motifs and decompose them uh, here, you end up in what you see in the end uh, simplified in, in, in your data. So you basically have here um, an interaction from ALDO A to ALDO um, B, and also from ALDO A to ALDO uh, C. And then on the other hand, you also might have reverse interactions here between ENO3 and ENO2, where one is a bait and the other one is a prey or vice versa. And in addition to these um, interactions where one is a bait and this other one is a prey protein, you might have some sort of confidence score, some um, interaction probability, which reflects um, uh, basically um, how much uh, uh, confidence do you have that this is an interaction beyond background levels um, and background binding levels. And this um, a file you basically start importing in other, uh, either R or Python. So you uh, uh, typically start with uh, some sort of a data frame object. And then in order to unlock um, uh, uh, graph algorithms, you might turn it into a bioconductor graph structure or a Python um, graph structure. Of course, there are other graph structures around that we maybe didn't use here in the very first place. Very popular is iGraph, but the good thing is that uh, there are conversion functions. So this is a simple function call to turn maybe um, this GraphNell object or this network X object into an iGraph object. Of course, as we're um, working with um, um, a bigger data, um, we also started to experiment a little bit with an Apache Spark um, a backend, which allows um, uh, data chunking. So you have on disk um, a state of storage and implicit parallel computation. You can spin that up. That is uh, a little bit the computational side of things. From um, the end user side of things, this, this graph frames, uh, framework is quite nice and intuitive because it basically goes away from this somewhat bulky graph API to a data frame based API for graph, where you basically just have an, a data frame for the node data and a data frame for the edge data and everything else is abstracted away from the user. And you have um, basically all kind of graph algorithms that can be performantly um, executed, including so something like Google PageRank, which is quite um, um, helpful when you do something like a network propagation of disease association scores. So far to the um, import piece, a first thing that um, you typically want to do is to um, check on um, how do your um, PPIs of your networks actually overlap with um, known protein complexes. And for that, there are, of course, comprehensive databases. Here we are importing protein complex from the quorum database. And then you can um, ask, uh, how do you represent these um, uh, complexes? Well, you can basically represent them in the way that we have it down here. So you basically have a 
list of where a complex is a fully connected graph instance. So you basically draw an edge between every single subunit of a complex and can then basically check, do you, do, do you actually see all of these edges in, in, in your PPI network? Well, a certain amount of overlap is, of course, expected just by chance. And as we are increasing in versions and also compare between cell lines, we typically also want to uh, do some sort of statistical uh, assessment. So one thing that we implemented here is a, a sort of a random sampling test where we basically pull out repeatedly from the network the same amount of nodes that we're having in the network and check whether the amount of edges that are connecting these uh, 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 a set of random nodes is, 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 is bigger or smaller than the one that we actually observe on that complex. And there are uh, a certain amount, uh, there are certain covariates that you would likely want to account for. Uh, uh, an obvious one is node degree. Um, uh, another one may be inherited to the um, 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 bait and prey um, 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 problematic that we are having here with APMS. You also want to account for the number of subunits and the bait and prey ratio um, in the complex because, um, of course, uh, these baits have a higher chance to, uh, the more baits you have, the more um, uh, interactions you expect. And this testing strategy can be, of course, generalized to other gene or protein set of interest. For example, we might be interested in overlap on pathways or other uh, functional gene sets. We'd also like to understand um, uh, are there certain structural features that mediate um, these PPIs? Uh, for example, what about protein domains? So the protein domains are part of protein sequences that uh, fold independently into three-dimensional structures. And um, um, those could be, of course, features that, that, that uh, tend to explain what kind of PPIs are happening. And um, uh, here we're also importing from existing databases. Um, domain knowledge on proteins have been collected in the early days of bioinformatics here from PFAM. Um, we don't have much protein and protein structure information in Bioconductor, but I found this good old PFMDB annotation package, which was quite helpful to annotate for each protein in the network, basically domain information. And then again, you can do some sort of enrichment test here. We're doing um, a, a basic two cross two contingency table, Fisher's exact test with all its um, uh, benefits and disadvantages. And basically you can ask, okay, how many PPIs are connecting to domains that you're studying? How many PPIs are actually involving either of the two domains and how many PPIs are not involving either of the two uh, domains? And then you test basically the number of PPIs that are connecting both domains based on the hypergeometric distribution. And we are visualizing that with alluvial plots. So, uh, and you basically see here that there are around 300 interactions that are connecting the HSP90 domain with the Pekin, uh, 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 with the Pekin um, domain. Well, now we have talked about complexes and domains, and we have uh, um, um, basically checked for interactions. But another thing to corroborate um, whether there are indeed these interactions happening is to look at structural data. So for example, within the complex, we actually would like to know, do these subunits are actually physically close enough to each other to interact? So if we're looking here at a certain protein complex, maybe this, this uh, a quorum con uh, complex, we uh, can of course see here that this particular subunit has a hard time maybe um, interacting with this subunit as it's just like physically in 3D space too um, uh, far apart. And in order to enable such kind of um, analysis, we're importing structural data from the protein data bank. Um, uh, we don't have much support for that in Bioconductor, but there are some really awesome um, packages on CRAN, such as Bio3D or R3Demo, which I um, highly recommend. And then you can basically look at um, um, calculation of distances between atoms between different chains of, of, of such a protein complex. And then we're um, applying a, a threshold-based approach where we say, okay, if there are atoms between two different chains that are 
um, um, uh, below a certain threshold. Here we're taking six angstrom as a default, but then as a parameter to the function, we infer a direct interaction within that complex. Otherwise, these are indirect interactions. And then you can back, uh, then you can go back to the same thing that we did for the protein complexes before and check whether um, uh, these structurally inferred um, interactions are actually matching the one that you looked at in um, um, uh, just a complex at itself. The last piece um, that we looked at were integration of the data with, with, with omics data. And here we, um, um, in the beginning, focused on transcriptome data and proteome data, but we have lately also um, started to um, bring in copy number variation data and, alter and alternative splicing data. But here for the transcriptome data side, we basically have pulled RNA-seq data, specifically investigating these two, two, two cell lines. So these HEC-293 cell lines and these human color cancer, uh, colon cancer cell lines. And then um, from the proteome data, we actually imported a data set that were accompanying this uh, Bioplex uh, 3.0 publication here, which compares the both cell lines with um, mass spectrometry. And then we are representing, of course, these data sets with um, uh, well-known data structure in bioconductor space or in Python space, which are also interchangeable, such as summarized experiment and end data. And then you can do a bunch of things, of course, with uh, this data. And um, I'm just pointing here out um, two things. Well, one thing goes a little bit into the quality control side of things. You can start to look at assessing um, variability in your APMS experiment as a result of bait and prey expression. Of course, the more um, a, a prey is actually expressed in the cell, the higher the chance it is um, uh, to, to, to show up as an interactor. And the same is to a certain extent true for bait. And then what, what, what I'm showing here is kind of like a basic observation where we're uh, doing a differential expression analysis between the two a different cell line on transcriptome level but also on proteome level, and uh, you see that it's uh, quite reasonably um, um, uh, correlated. And then you can basically ask, okay, when you now go into your networks and you, you, you take, for example, here such a full change as a score, are there certain parts of the network that, that, that aggregate these scores um, a, a lot uh, and indicate, okay, there are a lot of difference in this network between these two different cell lines. And often enough, after this maximum scoring subnetwork analysis, you end up with still a quite big and bulky um, a high scoring subnetwork. So you can apply something like gene set enrichment analysis to identify themes um, within these modules that, that aggregate a lot of scores. And we have actually put here um, a little um, R and shiny graph um, uh, viewer together that uh, basically once you have identified such um, uh, gene sets or, or, or so high scoring subnetworks that you can uh, overlay with different uh, metadata on the nodes or on the edges in order to explore that further. With this, I'm, I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. Thank you so much for the attention. I will be happy to answer any questions. And I just wanted to point out that all of this stuff is available. Um, basically, um, the Bioplex package, which is available on Bioconductor, the Bioplex Pi package, which is available on PipPi, and then the various interactions that I had shown uh, for protein complexes, for protein domains, for protein structures, but also integration with omics data is in this GitHub only repo here, this Bioplex analysis repo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We can start with uh, one from the online chat. So uh, this is for Ludwig. Uh, Ryan Thompson asks, so given the asymmetric bait prey relationship, is the resulting PPI graph a directed graph? This is correct. And actually, you indeed also store for each um, um, node on the node metadata, whether it's a bait or a prey, in order to enable such um, analysis that I mentioned in the very last part, where you maybe want to check are there is there is there a relationship between expression and showing up in interactions? Uh, 
Um, th thanks for the great presentations, all three of you. Uh, uh, Ludwig, um, if I had a new isoform that is not part of the annotation, and I um, use Bioplex to tell me like how this structure will be and how that will change which proteins it could interact with. Well, um, if you have a new isoform and you want to know the structure, then I'd recommend going to AlphaFold, right? So this is this new tool that came out from Google DeepMind, um, where they basically used deep learning um, to um, kind of like solve this protein folding problem. And um, uh, this will be really, really be the tool here. I think like when it comes to uh, finding the interactions, you could, so you're saying this is an isoform for a protein that already has isoforms in Bioplex for which we know interactions. Is this what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. Or is this so an like, isoform let's say, let's of say a, a completely uncharacterized protein? No, let's say it's already uh, it already exists and like yeah, like yeah. With AlphaFold, yeah. maybe I get the new structure. Um, yeah, with AlphaFold, you would get the structure, and with Bioplex, what I think you would do, you would um, check other either forms of this protein, and you would get the interactors. And then you, if you would like to know something about the function of this uh, isoform, you could do something of like guilt by association, where you maybe like check where are these other isoforms with what kind of proteins do they interact, and what kind of functions do those proteins actually have, if that makes sense. Cool, thank you. And I have another one for uh, Paul, but Badia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Sorry. Um, yes. Um, so my understanding is that the coupler is based on this database of um, transcription factor perturbation experiments. So um, how generalizable it is if maybe what I'm studying um, as in, was not part of those perturbation experiments. Maybe I'm, I don't know, in my case, let's say I'm working with human brain data. Um, how much can I trust the results and how, how will I know if it's maybe guiding me in the wrong path? <laughs> like, is there any fail safe? Yeah, good question. Just a, uh... So the, the perturbation experiments were a, a, a benchmark data set that we use, but the, the, those are not included in, inside the coupler. It just, uh, so the coupler is agnostic of the kind of data. You come with your data, and then you can fetch prior knowledge, and you can use different methods. So what the methods, uh, have, as i shown, uh, they are quite similar. So I mean, some of them perform, seem to perform better or worse, depending on this benchmark data. But what's really important is that your prior knowledge that you use is correct. And this is not an easy question to answer, so it, it really depends um, on, for example, how to evaluate these uh, gene regulatory networks. And this is something that uh, we have started looking in, in the lab. But yeah, there is no, no clear answer to this. So there's a there's another online question for Ludwig. Does Bioplex allow us to study protein interactions in light of post-translational modifications? This is a great question. Um, I think like from the top of my head, I would say no, um, because um, these bait proteins that you express are basically coming off from 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 a library, so they typically uh, are the canonical sequences without um, um, uh, uh, post-translational modifications. If you could, then it would be most likely on the um, prey side. But to be honest, I haven't seen it in any of the papers, uh, so haven't um, embarked on that at all. It's a it's a it's a great question that I likely could bring to, to Edward Hudlin, the um, uh, PI of the Bioplex project. Thanks for this question. Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank all three speakers one last time.